It's another waiting for next year.com podcast. Andrew is on the line. How's it going, Andrew? Going well. So I recapped the Browns victory over the Giants and I talked about the quarterbacks. I, I'm going to let you weigh in on the quarterbacks first before we talk about the topic at hand, which is mm-hmm. uh, the 11 Cleveland Browns players who were kneeling during the national anthem. The, the Colin Kaepernick debate comes to Cleveland yep. um, and we'll, we'll get into all of that. But first, um, if you had to make the decision, if you're Hugh Jackson, um, how are you looking at these quarterbacks how much do you hate your front office and what what's the what's your call what's your call <laughs> yeah um so it's, it is interesting a little bit as a head coach's decision um how confident as a head coach are you that you're going to be the coach two years from now you know i think that's always the thing that makes it hard because like, unless me, you're I bill belichick obvious, <laughs> yeah i think there's an obvious way to go here and i think that's to make kaiser the starter i think that's what's best for the browns in the long run if you're Hugh Jackson, I don't know if that creeps into your mindset at all. Like I, I wonder if your decision is solely like, look, I can't go one in fifteen again, or I'm not going to be here next year. So I need the guy that I think can win the most games for me this season. Now, I personally have not seen necessarily enough from Brock Osweiler to feel like he's obviously the the answer to that question either. Like. I I think the offense looks a little sharper with Kaiser. Um, I just – I don't know that the stats bear that out necessarily, but just to the eye test, they just seem to have a little bit more life uh, to them with, with Kaiser um, under center. So me personally, like I'm all in for Kaiser now at this point. You know, you and I talked, you know, a week or so ago and uh, – you know, I think at that point I was actually kind of still leaning towards maybe hoping Kaiser wouldn't play too much this year. I was certainly, you know, concerned about him playing with these with the lack of threats that the Cavs or the Cavs, while well, the Browns have on their offense. Um, but at this point, after having now watched two preseason games, um, I've really come around on that, and I'm I'm sold on wanting to see more of Kaiser. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I just, it, for me, it's a matter of time. Like, I always hoped that Kaiser was going to be uh, somebody, somebody worth um, investing time and and patience in. It just, I get a little bit nervous. And it was funny. I was listening to the A to Z podcast, and uh, and Andre Knott had the perfect comparison where he said that um, Deshaun Kaiser is like a really, really unripe green banana. Like you could, you could eat it now, but you know, it's going to be better like five days from now. Yeah. That's a, I suppose that's probably a pretty fair way of looking at it. Um, yeah. So anyway, the real topic of conversation, because you can go anywhere for uh quarterback talk, um, is, you know, the, this, this whole thing. Um, and, and it's surprising to me that this story, I don't feel like it actually came out until somewhere around halftime or thereafter, that uh, eleven Cleveland Browns players knelt during kneeled during the uh, national anthem, um, one of which is the first white player to kneel during the national anthem, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And I don't, you know, I don't want to talk about it like everybody else talks about it. It's it's a weird thing to me where I feel like it's a story and a non-story both at the same time. Like I I think there it could be a story, but it's just the, these aren't these aren't the first guys. These aren't the second guys. Th- this is not the front line of the conversation. It's just it's just another little bit of a very lar- a much larger conversation that was started by Colin Kaepernick and carried by, carried on by some other players and whatever else. But like, it just feels like the me t- uh, a me too conversation here in Cleveland. Either we're g- going to engage in the whole thing from like all over the country. Or we're not going to talk about it at all. And yet I see Browns fans weighing in now that it's hit home on this personal level. You know, they're reviewing the Browns poorly on Facebook and saying they're never going to watch another game and things like that. And it just, it's like, if you didn't have an opinion on this when it was Colin Kaepernick doing it, or I, I don't, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like, 
I don't know. I just don't think it's, I, I guess I don't think it's that big of a deal. It's a personal choice. Mm-hmm. It's not what I would teach my son to do, kneel mm-hmm. for the national anthem. But then again, you know, I, I also know that I, I'm kind of fortunate enough not to be in any kind of situation where I, I need to protest something via kneeling. I don't know. Right, right. Well, yeah, so. Uh, I know I just like threw out a <laughs> bunch of stuff there. Yeah, uh, no, that's a lot, but it, it's all good stuff. Um, I sort of look at it, in, you know, in a couple different ways. Um, one thing that's interesting to me is, to your point, this really all started with Colin Kaepernick, and obviously he's sort of bore the brunt of the anger, if you will, and now what you're seeing is more and more players, you know, across the entire NFL starting to uh, follow suit, and it's like, if there's only so much anger, it's a lot harder when it's spread among, when you have to spread it amongst all of these players. So the more players who do this, the easier it gets for the next guy, right? Like so, um, whether it be Michael Bennett who doing it, Marshawn Lynch, you know those guys do it. Um, uh, while the uh, Saints guy, who Ohio State guy, um, wow, I really don't know, but it's uh, fine. Yeah, or not? Not Saints, Eagles. Um, the Eagles. Um, wow, words. Um, anyways, the point being, as yeah, it doesn't matter who the player is. As those guys do it, it uh, it sort of starts to get easier for the next guy, and then all of a sudden you have a big group of Browns doing it. Now it's going to be even easier for the next guy, and that's not to say that there's not value in what they're standing up for, but you wonder if the message gets a little diluted over time, and if this some, becomes something of a game of telephone, you know, where as each team has different guys starting to do protest, are they all protesting the same thing? Do they all have the same end game? Um, are they going to do this? in perpetuity or is there an end game to get out of it? Like there's a lot of questions involved in that, right? That, um, well, and are they, are they now protesting the, the supposed or actual black balling of Colin Kaepernick? Are we still talking mm -hmm. about the original message of Colin Kaepernick? Has he become a a martyr? Like, I just don't know. And I don't know that it matters to me. Like Mm I, I'm, I'm fine with whatever they want to do during the national anthem, as long as they're not screaming during it. Right. Absolutely. Like, that, and that's that's where I come out on this. Like I have, I can understand anybody saying like, you know, this isn't what I would do. Like you know, you said that you know that it's not what you would teach your kids. Um, it's something I wouldn't do myself personally. Um, but <clears throat> I, I totally understand where these guys are coming from, and I don't I don't have a problem with it. Like, to, but to me the national anthem is sort of just a song like, you know, it may not be super patriotic of a thing to say, but I, we talked about this a little bit in our, in Slack um, today, we were talking about it. And, you know, for me, like it, it's a weird thing that the national anthem is even played before sports. Like I just don't totally get what one thing has to do with the other. Like where does national pride fit in with, a professional sports league. By the way, I heard some interesting perspective on this on the radio today that, that they initially started playing the national anthem before very big sporting events around world war one, not every sporting event, but very big ones. And then the, the frequency picked up to every game sometime during world war two, when it was, you know, the, the whole mm-hmm. world was fighting and, and every, you know, the draft and well, the yeah, Nazis world II, and, we had athletes leaving their sports to go fight. So you can understand the nationalism there from that perspective. Um, I'm just saying, like, it wasn't always so that we played it before every single um, every single sporting event. Right. Um, no, I, I and you know I understand why they did it then. If they were if it was being tied in with you know World War One and World War Two, like obviously I can understand what you know. And like I was saying, when you had actual athletes going and leaving their sports to go fight, I can understand you tying sports and, um, you know, national pride together a little bit more. But in 2017, I don't know if that still makes a whole lot of sense. And the, my bigger thing is I, this is what bothers me about the people who are really viscerally angry about this. The people blowing up our Facebook page with hateful comments towards these players. Um, the people who say, 
I refuse to spend another dime on the Browns. I will never support the Browns again. They should cut these guys right away. Where I don't understand that perspective, I guess, is I've been in Cleveland Browns Stadium when the National Anthem is playing. And it's not like the fans are all standing at perfect attention, you know, really into it. Like you hear people talking, laughing. Um, you'll see people looking at their cell phones, you know, checking Twitter, checking, making sure their fantasy football lineup is set at the last minute. Like there's a lot of different ways that everybody reacts to the National Anthem. And I don't understand why it's this sacred thing that just because the athletes are down on the field that they have to – stand perfectly st still in the way that you want you want them to like i just i really struggle with where that anger comes from in well there's a, there's another part of that too like let's say let's say these guys are absolutely a hundred percent dead wrong and someday they're going to live to regret their awful awful transgression um okay D does that mean does that mean they should all be cut fired kicked to right. the curb if they're so yeah. wrong and why wouldn't you give them a chance to realize they're wrong at some point in the long run, especially if they're not doing anything necessarily to disrupt the anthem mm -hmm. for everybody else? That's yeah. I guess that's where I come out on it. Like, and so I don't understand the cut everybody. You know, yeah. That if you kind of want, thing. if 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 your opinion is that this is very very wrong, what these guys are doing, obviously you would prefer they to come around to your way of looking at things, but when you just tell them they should just cut them right away. I don't think that's really giving them an opportunity to understand any other point of view from it. Like we talked about this also in Slack today, the Isaiah Crowell thing, when he um, posted the image of the cop, the violent being, imagery of the, the police officer of the yep. being, being murdered. Um, that was shocking. And that was upsetting. And, and I was pretty and angry dead about wrong. That. And one hundred percent wrong. And the easiest thing in the world would have been for the Browns to just cut him right away. But if they did that, does he learn from it? I don't know. Um, but I can tell you that the way that was handled, they gave him an opportunity to learn and grow from it, and he has. I mean, he went above and beyond. I think what anybody expected. I expected a boilerplate apology, and that to be it. But you know, he's really gone out of his way to try to not just educate himself, but to educate even other people on where he was originally coming from. And just so we can say, have that conversation, have that dialogue and say, look, you know, I don't know who's right or wrong here. Obviously posting an image like that was wrong, but here's where that anger came from. Here's why I felt so angry that I posted that image. And then you can say, okay, well, I understand at least where that anger is coming from. And I don't agree with your actions on that anger, but yeah, let's find some common ground on what caused that anger. And they, like, there's all this room for dialogue. And that's what I was so, so, I don't know if proud is the right word, but I was so happy to see Isaiah come out of that and really open up a lot of dialogue about it. And that's, that's what disagreement's about in this country to me. Like we should be able to have civil disagreement and um, that without just calling for everybody to be fired right away immediately. And uh, you know, I just, I just don't understand that, that perspective of it. And and like I said, like, but I also struggle with it because I have a hard time even understanding being like that emotionally upset about the way other people behave during a national anthem. Like, I just don't care that much. Like, if, if these guys are kneeling and standing up for something that they believe in, like, I more power to them, I guess. I just I don't see it as that big of a deal. Um, and if they if this is a chance for us to actually be successful, and this is where there's a lot of debate, you know, on how effective this is as a protest. Um, but if, if, if we're able to actually start to have some kind of a conversation at some point about what it is, these guys, these, all of these players are saying by doing this, then to me, that's nothing but a good thing. No matter what side you're on, no matter who you agree with, if, if we're at least discussing it and trying to have an understanding on what the other side is saying and why they feel the way they feel, that's all good things. So I, I'm even optimistic that, you know, or hopeful that something good can come out of this at some point, that at some point we can reach a point where these protests really spark, you know, either change or discussion, conversation, whatever it is like that. That's what I would hope would come out of this. Yeah. I just, I, I agree with what you said. Um, to me, uh, it just, at this stage of the, the story, 
the the Browns and their guys are just more people on the larger story. And so either yep. either you're ready to have a conversation about the larger story or you're still mad about the larger story. But this is like I I very much like any bit of news in the last year. I think I've told people this on the podcast and behind the scenes like I've I cannot do the iterative version of stories anymore. You know, like mm -hmm. I can't follow the ups and downs of every single issue that happens in national politics. I can't do it in sports. Like I don't even the Kyrie Irving stuff. I didn't want to go up and down and up and down and up and down. Let me let me get a little closer to the conclusion. Let me see, you know, what the you know, if you worry about something 17 times on its way to a conclusion and then it turns out OK, then you worried 17 times for nothing, <laughs> you yeah. know, and so either we're ready to talk about this in a serious manner and the things about Colin Kaepernick and whether he is being blackballed. Like I, we talked about that before and I said, look, I don't want to talk about whether Colin Kaepernick is blackballed until we get to a certain point in the season. Mm -hmm. And now that we have two preseason games under our belt and maybe even, you know, before the first preseason game, it's time to talk about Colin Kaepernick. But I didn't want to talk about it as he was still looking for a job and as still free agents were still signing everywhere. I just can't follow all the ups and downs all the time. So maybe yeah. maybe now's the time to talk about Colin Kaepernick and how he's been blackballed. Um, and maybe and maybe it's time to talk about his message again and why it seem it's seemingly right. unwelcome in the NFL. But and that, to, to me, that's the bigger thing is that for the Kaepernick nobody cares. Story, nobody cares if the NBA players uh protest right there's just well, something about the nfl yeah that's that's there's certainly a degree of truth to that too but even the kaepernick thing like the kaepernick story right now is his employability right like yes. does he have a job or not and why doesn't he have a job but like the story isn't the issue of what he was trying to stand up for in the first place and that's where that's where this is really a, a, a kind of a interesting thing is like, you know, e even the Browns thing, like if let, like, let's just keep this close to home. The stories that we cover and the things we cover, there was a lot of talk about the number of Browns involved. There was a lot of talk about Seth the valve being the first white player to uh, kneel during it. But I didn't hear a lot of discussion about what exactly these guys were protesting. No, you know, that's, that side of this is not the, the conversation that we're having. And I think that's, um, that's the thing that's really interesting to me is just that the story is all about this action in, in the context of how is this a reaction to a song, the national anthem and what the national anthem means to uh, a lot of people. And that's the story. And I think that that's why it's, we're getting almost lost in conversation or lost in translation. I mean, is that these two sides are trying to say different things. Like if you have a problem with what they're doing, you want what they're doing to be the conversation, but the people who are kneeling don't necessarily want the kneeling itself to be the conversation. They want the reason that they are kneeling, which is the particularly, at least, you know, the way it began with Ka Kaepernick was certainly inequality. Um, and I think that that's what most of these guys are saying um, is, is that they're protesting is the inequality in this, in this country and, and and but you're right we're we're not talking about that we're talking about kneeling yeah so that's what's really interesting maybe that's why it's hard to find common ground on this is because we're having two conversations at the same time and the one that's winning is the one that's about kneeling like that and we're back so anyway the, I, I think we're just finishing up the idea that we're talking about kneeling instead of the actual issue yeah just just the fact that we're having two different conversations and uh i and I just think that that's a that's that's really what's making this kind of difficult to have any uh, any sort of light at the end of the tunnel as far as a resolution for this. This isn't a story I think that's going away anytime soon. No, and and I I'm sure that's very disappointing to a lot of fans, and I understand why people would be upset at uh, at, at what what many fans feel is a uh, disrespect of the national anthem and then by proxy, a disrespect of troops or police officers mm -hmm. or whatever. I like, I get it. I really yeah. do get it. Um, I just think that, uh, 
you know, if, even if you think it's a mistake, you just, you have to be willing to let people make a mistake and learn from it. If, if that's what you feel and maybe they'll come around to your side, maybe they won't, but, um, yep. you just, you, you kind of, it's very tough uh, as a control freak myself, as somebody <laughs> who tries to control every situation I'm in. And even to the point where like, sometimes I control the people I work with and the people around me. And I, I, I've learned very, you know, uh, quite frequently over the years that you just cannot do that. You have to let people be themselves as well. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the hardest things. Like, it's like, we want everybody to see the world the same way we do, you know, but we don't, we all have our own experiences that have led us to where we're at and we view things different. And, you know, we just have to be able to listen a little bit more, I think, to what the other side is saying. Um, and I know, I know you're right and I know I'm right and everybody else is wrong. But, yeah. You know, sometimes <laughs> you just have to let other people be wrong and we've learned That's to right. let everybody but us be wrong. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. Let's, uh, let's, even though, you know, I like, I've been keeping these things really topical lately. Let's go, let's go off the rails at the end of this one. Let's talk about something fun. Okay. Brand new. Oh yeah. So tell me. So, <laughs> um, well, so obviously brand new, um, dropped their new album, science fiction, um, fairly, uh, out of the blue. Um, there yeah, everybody been thought it was coming later. Yeah, there was, I mean, we certainly knew that they were working on it, um, but there was no indication that it was ready to come out last, well, Thursday night, fr Friday morning. Um, you know, there was certainly no indication that was ready. So it kind of came out of, out of the blue. And I think the most surprising thing is how damn good it is. Um, not that Brand New is a band that I should have lost a lot of faith in. Like, they've been a pretty solid, reliable band. Um, well, I mean, in terms of the quality of their albums, but, uh, I, there's something about this album, like somehow a lot of that sort of early two thousands emo influenced, uh, I was not expecting it to be good. I was expecting it to be at the drive-in where it was like an approximation or somebody doing an, almost like a band doing an impression of itself. Yep. Yeah, no, that's fully what I expected. And that's, it's surprising that it could sound so in the moment and it, it does not sound dated at all. Like it, this sounds like a relevant band in Didn't 2000. did sound like a step forward for them though? Absolutely. It did. Like it still sounds like them. Like it's identifiable as brand new. Like you're not going to be like, gosh, I don't even recognize them. But in terms of sort of, <clears throat> there's sort of a subdued quality to it that I think shows a lot of growth. Um, yeah, for sure. That, that I think they didn't have previously. Um, and you know, I, Daisy, Daisy was such a strange album, um, in, in a very different way. Uh, but like certainly when you've put out two iconic albums, like Deja Intendu and, um, devil and God are raging inside me. Um, you know, those are two tough albums to live up to, right? Like, um, and I think when Daisy came out, there was just a lot of reaction of, huh, well, this isn't like those albums. Um, and, but now that we've had, what year did Daisy come out? That was like 2006, something like that. I was going to say 2009, but you might be right. 2009, it might be 2009, but you know, it, it's been a while. Actually. Yeah. It's 2009. Cause it was eight years ago. Um, you know, I, I, uh, over time, as you've sort of stepped away from that a little bit further, I think this is a band that was a lot more comfortable um, with having that in their past, too. I think it just allowed them to take a big step forward. So I think you're absolutely right. I think this was a, a really nice step forward for them. Um, I have I have taken a step back from the first time I listened to it. I've listened to the new album probably straight through four times and another three or four times in bits and pieces, uh, mm -hmm. where I didn't have time to listen to it straight through. And I think it's certainly their, their best work since, uh, devil and God. And I think it's the most coherent they've been since Deja. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's the most from beginning to end. It, it works as a work. Yep. Cause if there was any criticism of devil and God, it's that it's disjointed. It's inconsistent. 
but I, mm-hmm. but I think I took that, that beginning to end, um, cohesiveness and I overrated it on my first listen. So when I'm ranking all the brand new albums, I still have Deja first just for me. Um, yeah. but this did not, this new one did not surpass the highs of devil and God, even though it is kind of more consistent in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think those pushes and pulls of Devil and God are what I love about that album and why that one is my personal favorite. I get lost I like in the second better half. Than Deja. I, I, can, I can understand that. I really can. But for whatever reason, that um, that disjointedness is what made it a more interesting album for me. It's just, you know, just it, just what it is what it is, you know. But um, I th- think that science fiction – is definitely more along deja in terms of that that coherency and the um oh i don't know what the word i'm looking for is but it's just a dependable album all the way through um that makes it a good listen yeah yeah i uh i also think i've realized that i'm not as big a brand new fan as the rest of the people that i know who are brand new fans because well, isn't it surprising how many people are like, I did not realize how many people would care about this album. Well, I guess I was a little on the older side for being a brand new fan just because mm-hmm. I was, I was probably in my, well, I was probably like 23 or so when they really, really hit. And and mm-hmm. I think a lot of, if I'd heard that, that, that band when I was 18 or 19, they would be the great, like maybe the greatest yeah. band I ever heard in my entire life. Which a lot of people feel that way. Like yeah. people who are into them, like they have a fiercely loyal uh, following. Like they they sparked something inside of people that dr- really drew them to them. But but I just thought it was a little interesting. Like I didn't expect as many people to care about this as as we've seen. Like there's been a lot of discussion and conversation around this album. I think that was a little bit surprising to me. Yeah, it's um, it's almost like when. Uh... No, it's not like that. I, I'm just trying to think of a, a comparison when when all of a sudden everybody in the world, something hits like a wider portion of the culture. I'm going, huh, I thought that was like from the, the, the smoky grog shop type clubs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know what a good comparison to that is, but. It was, uh, so it was interesting, though, you know, while we're talking about rock and. Uh, I was watching an interview with Kevin Devine after he played some one of the stages at Lollapalooza, and he found it. He's thirty seven or something, so he's kind of in our age range. And he was saying mm-hmm. that a lot of the fans seemed to kind of, like they enjoyed his his set, but they were almost kind of like mockingly making the metal sign with their hands because you know, like straightforward rock, guitar, bass, drums mm-hmm. is kind of like throwback or old school yeah. at this point. And it's if in my old head, it's very strange that that could possibly be the case, but I think it is. Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, you know, you still have, I mean, you still have like your arena bands, you know, Foo Fighters are still around and kicking. Coldplay um, crushed it in Cleveland. Everybody in the world was at Coldplay and enjoyed the show. Cause those yeah. guys know how to fill a stadium, whether you like their music or not. Queens of the Stone Age have an album coming out Friday. Um, I'm excited for and that. And I've heard it, and it's insane. It's so good. Um, but uh, so, you know, there's definitely bands out there still doing their thing. Um, but in in terms of what kids are listening to, and I guess when I say kids, I mean, I don't just mean kids, kids. I mean, even, you know, people in their early 20s. Um, it is sort of an antiquated notion. Um, but I'm not, always, I'm, I'm not really ready necessarily to completely write off that, you know, guitar driven, just basic rock music that coming out of garages. Like I think there's still room for that out there. It's just, these things go in cycles a lot. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, we're in the cycle where that's not the sort of trendy thing, I guess. Yeah, we're, I mean, it goes in cycles, but sometimes you turn a page on a certain thing too, and you never come back. Like we're at a, every minute that it's not like every minute that we go with rock and roll is uncharted territory in terms Mm -hmm. of, you know, like, how's this generation going to think about the Beatles? Will they, will they continue? Will they ever remember Primus? Will they, you know, I mean, they're just like, they're all these different things. Like when we think of the seventies, 
we are now down to the 12. I'm making that number up, but let's say it's like 12 important artists from the seventies. And there were, there were, there were so many people's favorite band that nobody mm-hmm. thinks of it all anymore. Yeah. Um, it, it's sort of that trickle down effect. Like if you think of like, uh, you know, you mentioned the Beatles, like does the reverence for the Beatles weaken with every generation? Like you probably feel like it has to, to a certain degree. Um, where See, I don't every... think it does for the Beatles cause they're Michael Jordan. But okay. I think, uh, but f- so like, um, there were, there were two or three bands probably that people thought, well, you know, I, uh, there was a, a portion of the population that liked better than the Beatles that thought they thought had more artistic integrity than the Beatles. The wonders. But, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the the Oneaters. <laughs> the Oneaters. <laughs> um, but, but the, the Beatles are the go-to answer. Right. Um, well, yeah, you know, every, every decade that sort of does get dis- distilled. Like if, if you want to look at like the seventies are the seventies down to like, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, um, the doors, Oh, the, the sixties, the doors are probably more sixties. Yeah. Um, boy, is that it? Like who, uh, and then Sabbath and disco. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, yeah, so it's, you're right. Like, I guess as time goes on, like certain things will survive out of that. But it's everything else. Like how many bands were, were just these really great bands that have been forgotten and lost to time? Well, in 25, well, years, from, 25 years from now, maybe people n- don't think about Smashing Pumpkins at all. Yeah, because... I was just going to say Alice in Chains. Does that happen to a band like Alice in Chains? And, where... sound, and Soundgarden. Because it, yeah. when, when Chris Cornell died, what's, what did everybody play in, in his honor? Black Hole Sun, right? Yeah. Soundgarden was reduced to one radio friendly song what are the chances 25 years from now that that one's going to endure instead of it's going to be it's going to be one pearl jam song one Mm -hmm. nirvana song and maybe zero uh sound garden songs probably zero alice in chain songs almost definitely zero smashing pumpkin songs because we're only going to have enough time for shorthand like even even bands like you know does rem get lost to time like, maybe, think about maybe. that. That's a band that could get lost to time. And to think and, that losing my religion would, could go away. Yeah. Considering like how many times <laughs> it's been covered and how many times we, it was played during its heyday. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the biggest song in the world for at least oh, the summer, yeah. at least like two seasons. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was huge. I mean, REM has this like storied career. Like this was the band that lived multiple lives. Like they for were those the, who are living, who are listening at home, this is Andrew's favorite band. <laughs> like, well, they've, I mean, they lived that life as a indie college radio band and then they became the arena band, you know? And it's like, I, not very many bands have like these two sides to their career like that. It's like, to me, it's just, it's, it's just wholly interesting. And it, like, it would just be a shame if that would all be forgotten over time. But I think there's a real threat of it. Yeah. I think there's even, even like, I even think of like the who, like, could the who be a band that loses their influence over time? Like, or like, I don't know that that's a band that's forever. No, uh, I, I think, I think they do lose their influence because let me tell you what, to me, the who are a one hit wonder with Bob O'Reilly. Everything else sucks. Ooh, 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 ooh. I, I mean, don't know. About I, that. Like, like, uh, okay. Rain, uh, rain on me, rain or me or whatever. Like yeah. they're, 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 they're a three song band in my universe. <laughs> and well, I know that's sacrilege to a lot of people and I don't disrespect the who, but for me, they're a three song band. The weird thing about the who for me is like the, who are the ultimate greatest hits band for me? Like I can, I can listen to any kind of greatest hits of theirs, like almost on repeat. And like, I love almost every song. Um, there's a few I can't stand, but, uh, but they're a much harder band for me to sit down and listen to their albums. And I suppose that's probably the most. I think your point is instructive over time. I think they become, they become an EP in history instead of the the greatest hits band with, with 12, 14, 16 songs or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet the world never thinks about rush rush will disappear. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think Floyd never will. Yeah. Like yeah, pink Floyd are the immortals. Led Zeppelin are immortal. Uh, the Beatles are immortal. I think that 
I'm biased on this, but I feel like Pearl Jam and Nirvana will both be immortal, at least for quite a while. I think they're um, the winners. Yeah. You know, that's if you're going to go back and say, what was the musical moment of the 90s? It was the it was obviously the Seattle scene and it was Nirvana and Pearl Jam, those two bands. And you know who the biggest quote. loser is of that whole era is Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. Yeah. And they will be. I mean, they just will lose. Yep. Oh, I, I feel like they always lost. Like they were always the, you know, they weren't, they weren't actually from Seattle, you know, so they had that strike against them, if you will. They weren't in the click, you know, that the, all those other bands were such a relatively tight knit group. Um, and, uh, they Stone Temple Pilots and to some degree Smashing Pumpkins too, but more so Stone Temple Pilots were always the outsiders. And then like the worst thing that could have happened to them is they were immediately made fun of by, uh, David Spade on Saturday Night Live. The, I liked them better the first time when they were called Pearl Jam. Like how many times did people like that stigma stuck with that band? Like for so long it was, oh, they're just the poor man's. Pearl Jam. Well, I can tell you as somebody who's a massive Pearl Jam fan, Stone Temple Pilots were a very different band from Pearl Jam. A very, very different right. band. Right. Well, and, and and for me, and and maybe you too, for those of us who kind of live through that era, because 96, I was 17 years old, um, that, that, that album just dominated my entire senior year of high school in 97. And um, I'm sorry, Tiny Music, Songs from the Vatican Gift Shop, just mm -hmm. and and it got trashed critically but for mm -hmm. me that was like one of the biggest albums of my lifetime at a moment yeah. that was like one of the biggest moments of my lifetime and and so um but i i also have the perspective to know that like it's going to get lost yeah for sure i, I mean I, and i feel like in a lot of ways it has like they've been talking about doing a re-release an anniversary release of core and um uh, you know, Stone Temple Pilot fans are really excited about that, but I haven't seen it hardly talked about outside of that circle. Like, that's just kind of a shame because they were really talented musicians. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, guess, guess who produced Tiny Music? Uh, do I remember? Did Butch Vig do it? Brendan O'Brien. Oh, Brendan O'Brien. That's right. That's right. Of so, Pearl Jam. Pearl fame. Jam. Yeah. Huh. I liked them better the first time when they were called <laughs> yeah. Pearl Jam. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've always felt bad for them, though, for that. Like, that stuck with them so hardcore. And the, I just don't think they really deserved it. Like, I, it was mean. Yeah. But. Well, and, and back then, the the um, the mainstream rock charts were a big deal. Yep. And they had yep. three songs off that album that were number one. Yeah. <laughs> so it just, you know, anyway. It's weird what history does. I, I'm almost positive that the 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 band that Time Forgot will include brand new someday. They're just oh for sure, <laughs> but uh, for sure. But for now, it's just really fun to talk about, and uh, it's nice to talk about on the heels of having to talk about the Cleveland Browns kneeling during yeah. the football game. <laughs> yep, so, full circle. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Uh, thanks for everybody for listening out there. Make sure that you go and find us on iTunes and give us a rating, hopefully a good one. Uh, thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. It's been the waiting for next year.com podcast.